I'm Jake Parcel. Um, I work at Flurry. Uh, at Flurry, we build an open source immutable graph database um, focused on trust, uh, data driven access policies, and linked data standards, um, which are all features associated with making a database that's good to do collaboration. Uh, collaboration can mean a lot of things. Um, so what is what what do I think collaboration is? I collaboration could be, you know, the when you start working with others. Now that might mean a multi-person team working together, uh, might be a multi-party project where different organizations are are collaborating around uh, storing state for the same um, purpose. Or, or it could be just as simple as um, you start working with data that's coming from the outside. Um, all those to me, um, you know, a, a lot of the attention that Flurry gets is the, the multi-party organization one that needs um, things like digital trust and data-driven access policies for multiple organizations to uh, work together. But I think that um, a lot of the concepts that I'll show today uh, have value even in that that latter one where I'm just starting to work with third party data. And uh, as you can see, there's some human elements around data collaboration that that start to um, take shape regardless of of how big the problem is. Uh, as Gabe mentioned already, we've we've been here several times. Um, the mission of building the Flurry uh, database has always been around those concepts that I showed on the first slide. But I think as we've evolved, we've um, adopted a bit to the market in our approach and our you know techno technological layers and how we solve those problems. So we've recently just launched. A new version of the database, uh, version three of, of Flurry, and then um, I helped build the the cloud offering of that, which is um, in public preview, so anyone can sign up at data.flur.ee. Um, and I'm going to go through a little bit of this uh, first to show you what your experience would be on signing up. So when you when you first sign up and log into Flurry. Um, you're at a, a getting started uh, homepage. And what we've introduced in the, this latest version is the idea of, of Flurry notebooks within our data sets. So if you click on a, a notebook, um, it automatically creates a data set for you and puts you in this mix of uh, markdown cells as well as um, Flurry QL cells that help you get started and understand what's going on. Um, and, and as I mentioned, well, I don't know if I had it on this uh, first sli slide, it's a mutable, mutable graph database. So um, when we add data, we create immutable commit files. Um, and then, you know, there's a query engine side of it as well. So when you get started uh, right away, you can see that, you know, you're greeted with let's let's make your first transaction. And then, you know, this kind of helps introduce you to some of the, the syntax you're dealing with with Flurry. Um, what you're looking at is JSON LD or LD is linked data. And it's a superset of JSON. So valid JSON is only thing that's necessary here for the most part with some added keys like uh, the ledger name. And we've auto populated that based on the ledger we created on your behalf. Um, and you'll start to notice uh, new things too, such as like ID, at ID and at type. Um, and and I'll, I'll touch on those in a little bit, but now we're getting into uh, classifying the data in a way that it can be linked uh, both internally and have semantic meaning outside your database as well. So you can go through and get started. You can transact data. You get a T value. That's another interesting aspect of Flurry. It is technically a private blockchain. So like I said, you get a new commit with every write. And then um, you can also query the database at any of those T values. So you can, you know, you have what we call time travel um, to, to see what the state of any object or subject was uh, at a given snapshot in the database. Um, so you can work your way through the notebook. I'm not going to 
um, read through all this. And the, there's some also some query screens in here where you can see uh, the results of a query. Now I've, like I said, I was on T14 here, so I've been playing around with this one. Um, we also have a, a policy a management UI here. So to help you so that you don't um, have to learn, you know, flurry QL right off the bat to to create a, a policy of, of who can access your data. Uh, and then this is important on the collaboration side as you know, you can invite collaborators in the system um, and then you can create a, a custom policy for that collaborator, which can dictate what data they can read and write to while they're visiting your data set page. We have a view data screen, which is more about a UI to run the query. So you don't have to do the, um, the query syntax, the Flurry QL to, to do a query. Um, you can start to just select the classes and the properties that are in the system to show uh, the data based on that. And then you can create more notebooks, create more queries, save them. Um, so the, the UI is a way, it, it's two things. It's a way so you can run Flurry without running your own infrastructure and also um, start to get some collaborative UI around using the database um, through the web app. So I showed you, um, basically what happens when you sign up and you create a sample notebook. And just to reiterate, when you transact data, we're creating commit files. Um, and in the commit files, and, and this might this will be important later on, um, you're going to get assertions and retractions to each commit file. You link to the previous head, you know, basic blockchain uh, data structure. And then it broadcasts those updates to any query servers that are listening. And those query servers are what maintain that index data likely in memory so it can serve it faster. So if you're transacting a lot of data and you have a blockchain, um, if you didn't have a running query server, basically you'd have to replay all of the transactions to, to get what is the current state of that ledger. Uh, so we're adding you know, some of those infrastructure with the query servers to make those ready to serve the current state or, or the state of any of those T values. And then when you query data, that comes from the index data from those query servers. Um, you know, the, Flurry has a big surface area, so I'm not going to get into all the things I can do, but one of the important ones is identity. So we have the ability to sign those queries or transactions ahead of time with a, a signature that would match an identity in the database. And you can use that identity to filter the results. Um, you know, one example I would give is like a lot of code you might write would be, you know, select star from something where the user ID equals this um, in order to scope your query. And then in your application code, you might check the session to see who the user ID and, and write that query in the fly. With Flurry, if that uh, query was signed by the user itself, they wouldn't need that, that where clause. The results of the query would just come back based on what their permissions were to see that particular, the data in that query. So collaboration. So wh wh why does this help with collaboration? Um, I like to think of it as problems in two buckets. Uh, one bucket is more the technical bucket of decentralized infrastructure, decentralized databases. And, and we'll get to that in a bit. And I think another, I don't know if it's overlooked, but um, I like to give it more attention is maybe the, the human element, element of data collaboration. So once we get humans involved in working with uh, data or state, um, some of the big issues that we run into is what do we name things? Uh, you know, it's cliche in development that, you know, I don't know if everyone's heard it, but two of the hard problems are naming things and, and cache, invalidating cache. Um, what, and we'll get into some of the reasons why naming things is hard. Um, shared meanings along those lines too. So even if we come up with good names, do we agree that that name means the same thing? Um, and, then, and then also trust. Um, who's allowed to, to change the data and who's allowed to access the data. So I don't know if, if you all are, have done this, but I've made 
bad names in my code. Um, and I've also not updated names when they start to mean different things for, for uh, you know, potentially laziness or, or you're in a hackathon and you're just trying to get things done really fast. Um, sometimes they're ambiguous. This little code snippet is probably isn't obvious what I'm conveying here, but the idea is, you know, you passed a user element to this function thinking, well, that was a user object and I'll get the ID out of it. Um, but oftentimes maybe you just pass the user ID already. So you don't, you're not even necessarily always clear, you know, TypeScript can help with this or, or type systems, but, um, as a, as a developer code you've even written, uh, you don't always remember exactly the context of what the name of that variable is without uh, reviewing other pieces of code. And then, so when you, we store state in a database, a lot of times, you know, for a single person operation, uh, we might just start mimicking the variable names we have in our application. So if we have bad names in an application, we're gonna uh, also use those bad names um, Maybe bad isn't the right word, but ambiguous names in in the state itself. Another example I'd have is like uh, you're building something with users in it, and someone from sales comes and asks, "How many customers do we have?" And, and you're like, "Well, um, you know, I write a query, and it's how many users are there." Uh, and they see the number, and they're like, "Well, that seems really large. I we we only get paid by you know ten customers, and you said we had a hundred. And they're like, oh, you want paying customers. Well, I have to select that from the accounts table instead. And then so that might now you've established shared meaning with someone from sales of, of what they mean by customer. Uh, now, in a bigger organization, that gets even more difficult sometimes. Uh, what does account mean to the sales team versus the finance team? Uh, a lot of these terms that we use when we do application development get very much overloaded. And within a as the group gets bigger, um, knowing that when you say account, the other person you're talking to has the same concept in their head gets more and more difficult. So to tackle some of this, we uh, Flurry um, uses uh, RDFS and JSON-LD, which I'll get into in a bit, but allows us to use and uh, shared vocabularies that have already been published or you can generate together as a group and store that with the data as well. So when you uh, say account, um, you might not just generally call it account, but it might be a very specific um, IRI or, or location to what account means and all the metadata on account that we agree upon. Um, there's also standards on shared vocabulary. You could go to scheme.org and see what they mean by a person or a thing or an event. Uh, and then they, they drill down even, um, below that, like a music event. And then those classes of, uh, objects or concepts have properties. And if we are working together and we share that vocabulary, then we we don't have to do as much translation when we um you know when i'm reading your data or you're reading my data like the the data becomes more self describing in the database itself and we don't have to uh, trace application code you know to to find out the root source of what that data is supposed to mean owl is a um a, a type of vocabulary or uh a taxonomy that's used by a lot of people and it has a concepts of uh, same as or equivalent property. So this gets more into like the sales team calls account one thing and the um, finance team calls it something else. Well, if those are two different databases, they might have uh, two different columns to, uh, or two different tables to name that same thing. Well, with uh, RDFS or JSON-LD, you can label the data in such a way that um, you can query it either way and still get the same result. So trust is another piece of it. Um, we establish trust by using cryptography uh, to, to sign things with uh, public private key sets so that uh, things can get signed before they're sent to the database. Um, so we can trust for sure that the identity that created or generated the initial transaction. And then that same identity be, can, can be used uh, in queries to make sure your policies adhere to the identity of the, the issuer of that query. 
identification of the data itself is also an interesting thing when you're doing collaboration. Um, you know, I don't know how often you've worked in an organization where there's maybe the duplication of the data. So you have a customer in 10 different uh, application data sets and you might use a key like a, an ID key, a customer ID that, that means the same thing. Um, and that's the idea of an IRI uh, was like a URL, but it makes it global, globally distinct or distinct within a namespace so that when you refer to an entity, it is the same entity and you're you're sure of that. And, and so now when you start working with the outside world, if you're dealing with like a company entity, like let's say PepsiCo, your IRI could be the same as, as the uh, PepsiCo in another data set or another database because you're using identifiers that mean the same thing. So we use uh, JSON-LD to address a lot of the issues um, around this. And JSON-LD is, um, is a superset of RDFS or, or RDFS represented in JSON is an, another way to think of it. Um, but, you know, these are triple stores or, or something, maybe you're more familiar with that concept, but the, you know, the nice thing about JSON-LD versus using RDFS, I guess, is, uh, at least for me, is it's in a syntax that I'm already familiar with. So it's a superset, like I said, of JSON. So, you know, in Flurry, you can actually just transact JSON. Like we could leave off that at ID and at type, and you would get um, an entity in there with name, nickname, and age already. Uh, but the more we decorate that that JSON with the um, things like at ID with an IRI or at type with the class of the uh, entity it is, the more powerful that gets uh, later on as you start to expand your database. Another, um, if you haven't heard of JSON-LD, you've probably used it a lot. Um, it's in about every product web page you'll visit, uh, and it's usually used as a way for to describe the objects on like a, a commerce page of or a events page of, of what those things are. So, so the search engines use RDFS and they heavily use like schema.org uh, vocabularies to agree on the syntax or the properties that an event would have. And that's how Google sometimes renders when you do a search, uh, you know, very rich, uh, results where you see graphics of things and prices and and things of that nature. It's because in that web page, uh, those items are represented with RDFS, or I'm sorry, with JSON LD. So those are some of the um, the human problems when you when you start getting into doing a uh, using a decentral uh, or a collaborative database. Uh, decentralization, I think, is more of the a, a technical problem. Uh, and decentralize your data becomes um, can become difficult. Um, you know, the idea, the architecture that Flurry's built with an immutable ledger lends itself to being stored in a de decentral way, uh, where we're not opening it up and and rewriting and changing files all the time. Um, but Flurry, like I showed the the web app there, is running a centralized platform. Um, that being said, like, a, you know, when we write those files, they're content addressable commit files. Like if you're familiar with IPFS, uh, that's how it works. So we're not looking for the name of a file and then the contents in that file change. We hash the, the file contents itself. And then that becomes the, the way you identify or find that file. Um, why would you use IPFS if you're if you're running a database, um, you know, like, like Flurry? So you could run Flurry on our, our cloud platform, but you could use IPFS as the, the data store to uh, store the commits. That, that makes it auditable. So, um, you know, you could run queries and see that that's what Flurry says the state is, uh, but you could also audit... Um, since since IPFS is decentralized, you could audit that yourself by replaying the, the commits and making sure that that's um, valid what the data is saying. You can, you can run your own query server instead of trusting ours um, in the same way to spin it up and point it to the head of the database and let it uh, crawl it to, to load its own 
indexes. Um, and then also you can run a version in your browser easily. So if you're building an application where it's really important for you to trust that the, the data you're serving is uh, exactly what the commits have been and the, the assertions and retractions, you could run it, one, run your own browser.